Hello everybody and welcome to another A-Level Chemistry question walkthrough video. In this video we're going to look at the tricky organic topic of preparing organic solids and liquids. And if you remember, that's an experiment that involves distillation, recrystallization, melting point determination and other skills associated with that. And if you study AQA, this is required practical number 10 that you definitely need to know inside out. If you want to have a go at the questions first, you can download them from the description and then you can mark them as I go through this video. And in this video, I'll be showing you the thinking behind the question in blue and explaining some of the background for what you need to understand before answering the question. And then the bits that are actually going to get you the marks will be shown in green. In this question, we're asked to look at the synthesis of benzoic acid, which is made from ethyl benzoate. And so the first stage in this reaction is where the ethyl benzoate, and that's this on the left hand side, is hydrolyzed in alkaline conditions. And that's why we've got sodium hydroxide here. And then we're given some data about the masses and the volumes of the different reagents involved. And we're given a little bit of information about what happens next. It's refluxed for an hour, which this is the quick setup for a reflux shown on the right hand side. And the anti-bumping granules are put in, the condenser is attached vertically and it's heated for half an hour. And then it's allowed to cool. And then they pour the hydrochloric acid into the cooled mixture and filter off the benzoic acid that precipitates and they filter it under reduced pressure. And so the first question asks us why the anti-bumping granules prevent bumping during the reflux process. And that's a simple answer. It just simply allows smaller bubbles to form and prevents the formation of large bubbles. And it does that by providing a large surface area for the bubbles to collect on, as opposed to lots of gas forming at a very small point. And then the question asks us to show by calculation that an excess of sodium hydroxide is used in this reaction. It's really common to have maths tied in with an organic chemistry question, whether that's atom economy or percentage yield or moles, such as here. So to do this, we are looking to prove the moles of both the ester and the sodium hydroxide and show that sodium hydroxide is greater. So if we have a look at the chemical equation, we can see that there is one mole of this ethyl benzoate for every one mole of sodium hydroxide. So if once we've worked out the moles of both of those two chemicals, the sodium hydroxide is a greater number, then it is in excess. And so to work out the moles of ethyl benzoate, we have to use the density here, 1.05 grams per centimetre cubed, and the volume, 5 centimetres cubed. And so since density is mass over volume, mass is therefore density times volume, so 1.05 multiplied by 5 gives us 5.25 grams. And then we've been given the MR of ethyl benzoate, so mass divided by MR gives us our moles, and so 0 0.0350 moles to three significant figures. And that's our first mark of the two. Easier mark for sodium hydroxide, we've got a volume 30 cm cubed, we've got a concentration 2 moles per decimeter cubed, so moles is concentration times by volume, got to divide that volume by a thousand because we need it in decimeters cubed, and that gets us 0 0.06 moles. And we can see now that 0 0.06 is bigger than 0 0.035, so sodium hydroxide is in excess. There is actually an alternative way to do this. Once you've worked out your moles of your ester, what you could do is you could work out the moles of sodium hydroxide that would be required, which would of course be the same number, and then you could divide that by the concentration, and you'd find out that you'd need 17.5 cm cubed of sodium hydroxide for that particular concentration to react. And so, Again, proving we've got an excess because we've actually got 30. But I prefer the method that I've shown you here, but they both get the same number of marks. Then the question moves on to say, well, why are we using an excess of sodium hydroxide? So specifically here, we're using an excess of sodium hydroxide to ensure that all of that ester is completely hydrolyzed or to ensure that all of the ester has reacted. And that's really why we ever use an excess of anything. It's to make sure that the other thing or things get completely used up, whether that's because they're really expensive, which is probably the case of the ester here, it's likely to be far more expensive than the sodium hydroxide, or whether it's because it's really dangerous to leave it unreacted. We definitely 
want to make sure that it gets completely used up. And then finally on this page, suggest why an electric heater is used rather than a Bunsen burner. That's quite simply the fact that many organic compounds are flammable. So to personalize it to the situation here, the ester is likely to be flammable. So we're preventing ignition of any flammable vapors that form during this process. And so this is a really common organic chemistry question. They either ask it like this, or they ask you to draw a diagram of the setup, such as my reflux one that I've shown higher up the page. And when they get you to draw this, they are going to be really keen that you don't show direct heat with a Bunsen burner. You should always show a hot plate or a heating mantle or a water bath for the organic liquids container to be submerged in during the heating process to prevent that direct contact with the flame. And then the question moves on to more methodology related questions. So it says, why is reflux used in this hydrolysis? Well, that question might as well be, why is reflux used ever really? And so the answer is, reflux allows reactant vapors to be returned to the reaction mixture and so, crucially, it prevents that reaction mixture from escaping or any of the reactants or products from escaping. But it's the reactants that we care most about during the reflux process. So what that means is it allows you to heat the reactants at temperatures very close to their boiling point. So some of the volatile organic compounds will actually turn into vapors, but they will condense and be returned back down into the reaction mixture without escaping. So it's a very efficient method of making sure that you keep heating those reactants as aggressively as you can without losing any of them out of the top of the container. And then it says, write an equation for the reaction with sodium benzoate and hydrochloric acid. So the easy part is hydrochloric acid is HCl. Sodium benzoate will form as a result of the hydrolysis of the ester. You maybe won't have come across the hydrolysis of ethyl benzoate before, but what you've probably come across is benzoic acid before. And when benzoic acid reacts with sodium hydroxide, the salt that you make is sodium benzoate. And I'm showing the benzoate ion up here at the top of the page. And that benzene ring with the carboxylic acid group at the side, whenever it makes a benzoate ion, all you do is you get rid of this hydrogen, which is what was making it the acid, and you replace it with the sodium. So in the equation, the sodium benzoate has got the formula C6H5, that's the structural formula for a benzene ring without showing the ring, COONA, and that's what's going to react with the hydrochloric acid. And so when that reacts, what's going to happen is we're going to make the salt sodium chloride and the hydrogen is going to actually reprotonate the benzoate and we're going to make benzoic acid at the end. You could show this as an ionic equation, but I think it's perhaps unnecessarily complicated in this occasion to do that. And you could probably have the skeletal formula of the benzene ring inside it though and have the benzene ring COONA for sodium benzoate. Then G says, suggest why sodium benzoate is soluble in cold water, but benzoic acid is insoluble in cold water. And that, if you remember, is a really important feature of recrystallization, that solubility change as the temperature changes. And so we need to explore the structures of them, and we've already got them drawn in the equation. And so sodium benzoate is going to be ionic because you've got the sodium which will be Na plus and the benzoate is going to be that negatively charged benzoic acid with the proton knocked off. So it will be ionic and so therefore that means that it is going to be incredibly soluble because we know that ionic substances are generally very soluble. Whereas benzoic acid is going to be insoluble because even though we've got that COOH group, which is polar, we've got the benzene ring, which is something you need to know about as being very nonpolar. And that is a large part of that molecule and it is nonpolar. So overall, the molecule isn't very polar and so it won't dissolve very well in cold water at all. And so you need both of those for the two marks. One mark for the comments about sodium benzoate and the other mark for benzoic acid. And last of all, it's saying after the solid benzoic acid has been filtered off, it can be purified. And then it says describe the method that can be used to purify the benzoic acid. Well, this method is called recrystallization. So the question is basically saying 
describe how you would do a recrystallization. And there are some very distinct steps that you need to know about and some really key terminology that I'm gonna make sure I underline in my answer. So the first step is you dissolve your crude or your impure product, the benzoic acid, in hot water or hot solvent, if we're talking generally. And so it's really important that it is hot as per the previous question. And then it's really important that you also use the minimum volume of solvent possible, because what that does is that allows you to have a really saturated solution of your benzoic acid. And then what you would do is you would filter it whilst it was still hot, so it is literally called hot filtering, and that will remove any insoluble impurities from the solution that you've just made. Then you allow it to cool and crystallize, possibly surrounded by ice to really make sure you lower that temperature as much as possible to maximize your yield. And then once you've got your crystals forming, you will filter it under reduced pressure. And that's where you use your, your Buchner funnel and you've got your vacuum pump and you've got your crystals on the top in the, in the funny shaped funnel and the filtrate comes through the funnel and that's the bit that we don't care about. We care about the solid that's caught on the filter paper. And once we've caught that solid on the filter paper, we need to wash it with some cold solvent to make sure we don't actually dissolve any of our crystals and then allow it to dry. You'd probably continue with the vacuum pump to dry it as much as possible and then you'd let it air dry for a good little while to make sure that the last bits of that solvent have gone. So each of those six steps, really important, one mark for each of them. I've tried to draw labeled diagrams at the bottom of the page as I go through. So you can see a diagram of what's actually happening as well as where it is that you're getting the particular marks. And then we're finishing with a percentage yield calculation with a little bit of a twist. We're told that a student has used 0 0.040 moles of ethyl benzoate and they've obtained 5.12 grams of benzoic acid. We've been asked to calculate the percentage yield of benzoic acid and then suggest why the yield is not 100%. And so we're probably going into this thinking that it's going to be way below 100% and they've made some kind of mistake and they've lost some chemicals along the way. But that's not actually where this goes. If we work out the yield, we, there's two thought processes needed here. First of all, the moles of ethyl benzoate in, and the moles of benzoic acid that are going to be produced, they will be the same because the reaction ratio, the coefficients are one to one for ethyl benzoate and benzoic acid. So we're going to expect to make 0 0.04 moles of benzoic acid as well. We've actually made 5.12 grams of benzoic acid and as I've shown here, this is the formula of benzoic acid. We work out the MR of benzoic acid is 122. So when we do mass divided by MR, we get 0.042 moles of benzoic acid, which is actually bigger than we were expecting to make. We were only expecting, if everything had gone perfectly, for us to make 0.04 moles of benzoic acid. And so our percentage yield is 0.042 divided by 0.04 times by 100, and that gets us 105% yield, which is obviously not possible. We've not broken the laws of the universe here. So something's gone wrong. And then we're asked for our final mark, because it'll be marked for the percentage and a mark for the calculation. We're asked for our final mark to say, well, how could this have happened? And the answer is, most likely, they haven't dried the product properly. Or, maybe even worse, they forgot to hot filter it, or they didn't hot filter it properly. And so some, some impurities are still present in the product. One of those two things have to have happened. There's still some solvent on the benzoic acid or some impurities have crept in during the process and it wasn't quite done properly. Okay, that's the end of this question. That's the end of the video. Hope it was useful. I'll see you again soon.